Welcome to Chronic Combat Conversations, a live look at our best bets, picks, and predictions. With your host, TV Scouting MMA, and the MMA Guru, back after an unfortunate week off where we should probably start off by apologizing by, by not being readily available to you, but we thank you so much for being here for UFC 263. Adesanya versus Vittori 2. And, I mean, I cannot wait. I say this all the time, man. I cannot wait. This card is absolutely stacked, top to bottom. Figueredo Moreno 2. We've got Nate Diaz returning versus Leon Pokey in the Eye Edwards. <laughs> and, uh, That's Nate and Diaz to you. <laughs> and listen, we have the, the possible finale fight of Damian Maya versus Bilal Muhammad. You know, we've seen a lot of vets get get put down here in 2021. Could this be another one? Oh man, I you know, nothing is off the table at this point based on what I've seen recently in MMA. Uh and I got to be honest, anyone can. Th- th- this is going to be I will be in attendance. I'm flying. I have never been to a live UFC event before. I cannot wait. I hear that it is the best sport to witness live. I am uh like I said, excited doesn't really uh, put it into words. I really can't even believe that I'm going to be there. Man, the guru in the house, Arizona, going to be sweating a little bit, I imagine, uh, in your off time. 19,000 people sold out. I mean, I mean sweating, is, sweating will be an understatement. Yeah, man. But, damn, you're right. The energy is going to be there. This, I mean, did you see the press conference? These guys are ready to go. Man, uh I can't imagine how much fun it's going to be for you. Uh, I'm very happy you get to get out there. You've been a fan a little bit longer than I have, so uh, maybe in due time uh, I'll get out to my own event. Who knows? Yeah, we definitely – I feel bad because Izzy's your favorite fighter, so I wish we were kind of experiencing it together. We usually do try to watch the fights together, especially the pay-per-views. So um, I know I'll be uh, missing you by my side, but you know I'll have you for 264, hopefully, from McGregor Poirier. So, uh, oh, for sure, man. And – uh we do have some big news about a guest for that card coming up. And uh, unfortunately, we, we did have to have a last second cancellation on a surprise guest for last week. So unfortunately, um, due to emergency, uh, we did have to push things off. Um, you know, we, we will apologize, you know, in person in the future. But uh, we're very excited to bring uh, this episode for the pay-per-view UFC 263. We, we might as well get it popping because this first fight, uh, it, it might get a little sloppy. Uh, oh, it's getting sloppy. It, <laughs> it's it's call it Sloppy Joe Tuesday because we're getting sloppy in here. Carlos Felipe, e- extra sloppy. <laughs> Carlos is that Billy Felipe. Madison, what is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, that. because he's back in school, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got <laughs> the slop fest. Carlos Felipe versus Jake Collier, and actually, you know, as much as we joke around about it. These are probably two of the higher skilled and, and better gas tank heavyweights on the and roster younger. of the UFC. And younger yeah. heavyweights. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, Collier was out of the game for a little bit, but he's still only 32 years old. And, you know, he moved up from middleweight, which, uh, you know, I, I'd love to know, you know, the full story behind it. But uh, I got to say, after his first performance against a, a future top five in Aspinall, uh, first round knockout, making his heavyweight debut. Uh, Jay Collier did have a win last time out, uh, looking very good in a unanimous decision against <laughs> John Volante. So take that as you will. Um, but Volante does pack some pop, and uh, Collier was able to eat it at least in that fight. Uh, Philippe, on the other end of things, um, we've seen if you don't grapple him, uh, he is a very talented striker. Uh, you know, his loss to Sergey Spivak, you know, we saw a lot of that came from his deficiencies in the grappling aspect, but I don't know how much he's really going to have to worry about that here with Jake Collier. Uh, you know, he, he has done some BJJ and everything, so maybe we could see some wrestling, and uh, maybe if he can get a takedown, uh, you could see Philippe uh, have some difficulties. But Philippe also is a very talented striker. It's just um, while he looked great against, you know, Jorgen DeCastro, uh, against Justin Taffa, I mean, I really don't think he should have gotten that decision win, and that's that's kind of concerning, isn't it, Guru? Yeah, I would say that win was suspect at best. It it really wasn't a 
a great showing for Felipe, who uh, got outstruck by nine strikes total. Um, yeah. You know, was not nearly as accurate, 58 to 54%. I, listen, especially at heavyweight, I like a bigger guy. So if I can get a little bit more reach and a little bit more height with with Collier and uh, decent dog odds, you know, I, I, I've been looking to fade Carlos Philippe because I don't think he's that good. Um, could that end up burning me? Yeah, it's, I think it's possible. But, um, man, you, betting on Carlos Philippe is, is, is building a house on quicksand because I, I just don't – I don't know. At least it – He's got a. He can have a huge upside in in, in his career, but right now, um, I don't know. It remains to be seen. You know, the win against Jorgen De Castro doesn't even look as good because we've seen how you know bad Jorgen De Castro really is. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I was overly impressed. And as someone who laid a decent amount on Philippe at minus two hundred his last time out against Tafa. I was heavily sweating that decision and I wouldn't have been surprised to see it go to Tafa. On the other hand, Collier, he lands 120 strikes when he beats Sean Vellante, shows a nice array of leg kicks, um, good distance management as far as when the fight moved along, maybe not as much early on, but uh, Collier did show the ability to take a punch in that fight and uh, really compose himself uh, you know, he suffered a little cut, but uh, he really seems to power through and, and really set the pace from there on out. He's got wins by knockout, submission, decision in his career in the UFC. You know, no submissions, but against a guy like Philippe, is it really that far out of the question? However, you just look at the line straight up. And uh, I actually jumped on this one a little bit earlier in the week going against some of the stuff that I would normally do. But uh, right now, Collier is sitting at plus 144. And, you know, a little bit earlier on, I, I think I got him at uh, plus 160. Yeah, you can't hate the getting in on the on the, on your side early, um, especially at heavyweight when you don't really have to worry as much about a weigh in because no, I don't think anybody's ever missed weight at heavyweight before in the UFC. So um, I certainly like it. I uh, I guess maybe if I had any leanings, I do think it's sloppy, and I don't think anybody gets finished per se. So I think I like fight goes the distance. Will the fight go the distance? Yes, minus one thirty six. Not hmm. horrible, parlayable. I don't know if I'd play it straight up. Um, now that's on Fanduel, right? Yeah. What was it on uh, DraftKings? Yeah, because when I was looking on DraftKings, they actually had. Um a little bit more expensive line for the fight to go the distance. So I'm curious if, if it moved at all, because uh, yeah, I mean, to, to go the distance is minus 152. So there's definitely some value if you're looking at FanDuel right now, as far as the fight goes the distance. And honestly, that's what I think it does. So uh, I wouldn't, I, I would actually definitely recommend that, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I like it. And uh, you know, sometimes like we've said, uh, I do think that they, they they do specific matchups to kick off a card and and uh, they want it to be exciting, but I think this card's going to be exciting enough that um, they kind of got to put this heavyweight matchup somewhere. Um, one concern I do have with betting this over very quickly, and it's something I don't believe we t- touched on last time we had a pay per view, um, or maybe we did. <laughs> the crowd, me, the crowd noise. I do think that. Um, that adds something that 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 it can bring finishes like I remember in like the 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 just the sound from the TV in Tampa. Remember that Tampa card, that first the Masvidal Usman card. Like that card was like it had like this magic in the air. And yeah, um, what were there like six finishes in a row to end the yeah, card it, or something? Yeah, like that? just something crazy like that. Exactly. So I do wonder in a fight like this, in an atmosphere like that, is it possible that they? Um, do something crazy. Yeah, I, I do think it's possible, but um, yeah, so uh, definitely recommend being responsible with that one. If if you really feel good about it, maybe see if the line comes down a little. Maybe people do bet on a finish, and uh, if you can get a better line, great. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say I mean my play there is going to be Collier on the straight up on the money line. But if it gets below like plus one twenty five, it, it might not be worth it at that point. 
Uh, so let, let's go on to our next fight. Uh, we got Faris Ziam versus Luigi Vendramini. Uh, there's going to be a decent size differential. Uh, Ziam coming in at 6'1", and Vendramini at 5'8". Uh, Ziam also has a two-inch reach advantage. And uh, he's going to be two years younger here. He does have uh, four more fights total in his career than Vendramini does. And a lot of that is because of the injuries that Vendramini has suffered. Yeah, uh, a very Vendr- serious knee injury, right? Or two ligaments in the same knee or something like that? Yeah, the ACL, I think he recovered, re-injured. And, you know, it's been a very frustrating, you know, return. And maybe some stuff with his shoulder. Uh, that also happened in his last fight. So he didn't, he wasn't able to come back as fast as he wanted to. He's, he's moved camps a couple of times, too, from Constrictor Team, Team Alpha Male. Now he's at Factory X. But he is a black belt, been training since 12 years old, and also a quote-unquote Muay, Muay Thai black belt. So take that for what you will. But a uh, French kickboxing champion, K1 Sanda, K1 European champion, Freezeum, and also a little bit of wrestling in his back pocket. But, uh, yeah, that, that win over Malarkey is as sketchy as it gets. Uh, yeah, that malarkey, that malarkey fight was really interesting. Um, I It goes into this new category of judging and this new category of watching MMA unfold um, in front of our eyes where we're seeing whether um, how judges score takedowns without damage, you know, without moving position, without moving to an advantageous position like uh, they almost stalling in a way like what what are you going to do to wrestling without without like i said without damage and and i think you saw in that fight that they didn't you know i guess two of the judges whatever didn't credit malarkey for the couple minutes of control time i believe i guess in that third round i'd have to double check mm-hmm. the scorecards on mma decisions.com to make sure but i believe that third round was probably the diciest one yeah, I guess uh, the way I would put it is that, you know, Vendramini comes in with five knockouts and four submissions and one knockout loss on his record. Someone that hasn't ever been to the distance. Uh, Zim, two decision wins, one decision loss, but has 11 different finishes, two losses and nine wins in his career. I think this is one of those tricky ones where a lot of people think there might be a finish and it's possible we could see this go the distance. That's kind of what I was thinking and kind of what I saw earlier in the week. Um, I, I think it, was, it might just be too easy to just say, oh, zim has been choked out twice by rear naked choke. So now v- Luigi Vendramini is going to get the, the submission. Like, uh, yeah, it's possible. But like, hold your horses. You know, he, that, the, those two submissions came in 2016. He hasn't been finished since. And what you saw versus Jamie Malarkey, um, I mean, at least what I saw on some level, he was able to, um, you know, counter and, and move in in a lot of different ways um, that that actually were, were somewhat impressive. I know he spent a lot of time on his back when he really couldn't move, um, but I, there were, especially to end that fight where he reversed position and, and ends on top and stays on top. Um, he does have some of his own wrestling ability. He does have some takedown ability. And I do like the fact that he is taller and longer than Luigi Vendramini, who is probably going to want to strike anyway. Yeah, I don't know how great the wrestling of Vendramini is, even though he has his black belt with BJJ. So being the smaller guy here might be a little difficult to to get the takedown. But then again... You know, ZM, he's shown, you know, to get controlled. I, I really don't have a strong play here. If you ask me who I'm going to take for this fight, I feel like Vendramini might have a little bit of a brighter future. And losing by a flying knee to, you know, Zaleski Dos Santos in your debut, you know, that isn't the worst thing <laughs> on your record. Whereas losing to Don Madge in your debut, um, you know, not <laughs> not quite as exciting an opponent. Yeah, so if you ask me who I was going to take, I would say Vendramini might have a little bit of a brighter future. And uh, I would say that, you know, as a little bit of an underdog, if you're feeling crazy, go for it. I'm just not going to touch this one. I, I would agree with you. I do think that Luigi does have the brighter future. I was like, after watching him, the way he knocked out Jesse, Jess and Aria, Aria, whatever that guy's name is, I was like, oh, my God, I was so excited. I'm like, when do we get to see this kid fight again? And uh, it's obviously it's been like eight months. 
So um, maybe it's matchup problems. Maybe he was getting healthy. Um, I'm certainly excited to see him. I, I don't know. There's something in me that likes Faraz right now. I, I don't know what it is. That is kind of where I lean at the moment. Um, I feel like I'm going to eat my words. I feel like he's going to miss weight or something. I don't know what it is. But uh, we'll, we'll see. I, I lean ZM at the moment. Okay. No no real bets, like you said. Yeah. Um, I guess if we had to pick a prop, I would think. I mean, you don't have to. Oh, we have to. <laughs> Listen, ZM by points plus 210, or even Vendramini plus 360. I mean, both of those are pretty damn juicy because they really don't think it's going the distance. Fight will go the distance minus 104. So that's like, to me, that's even a little weird because that's like a decent number, mind you, where I think I would place it. But based on everything that I've heard and and based on the prop, uh, the props being so high for points, that doesn't, that's not really what they think. I just, right? I mean, when usually when you see a, a an even money to go the distance, you see like a, you know, a plus 150 for that person to win by decision or something. Well, I think to your point, looking at those lines, it really just shows that they don't have their mind made up with how the fight's going to go. And I think that kind of plays into why I'm saying I don't want to touch it because there is a high level of variability. And I don't think whatever play you make is really going to be a high percentage one. Yeah, this is definitely a huge high volatility fight because these guys are inexperienced. And like I'm saying, with a crowd, they could pop off. Like they could co- they could really show up to fight. So Yeah. I totally agree with that. Uh, well, in our next fight here, we have another young, young, young prospect uh, facing a guy that you know has definitely been around the UFC for a little bit. Chase Hooper, Ben Askren's son, uh, <laughs> maybe estranged at this point because like he kind of didn't bring him to the the Jake Paul fight. So like, I don't know. I saw that Chase Hooper was a little upset about that on Instagram. He's probably trolling. He was probably just yeah, no, nah, definitely. I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so Chase Hooper, 10-1-1 uh, one one, uh, in his career. He's 2-1 uh, and one in the UFC. One knockout win, one submission, and uh, one decision loss. Steven Peterson, 2-3 and three in the UFC. One knockout win, one decision win, three decision losses. I mean, Peterson is 10 years older. Uh, Peterson's got two more fights in the UFC and, uh, he came off of, uh, Dana White's contender series actually. Uh, so the thing that I was noticing is that Chase Super has had a pretty marked grappling advantage in most of his wins. Yeah. And, uh, he's got a black belt now. He did a upgrade level up in between and he's training with, you know, Steven Thompson now. So, you know, I'm sure he'll be high level karate when we see him out there, uh, um, Steven Peterson out of Fortis, uh, he's got a Brown belt, uh, BJJ. So I'm not really too concerned about him on the mat here. Uh, I think just his level of experience and, you know, sure we can see something crazy happen, but he hasn't ever lost by a submission and he has seven submission wins on his record. So it's not like I'm concerned about him losing by sub and eight decision losses. I mean, does Hooper out grapple him for the majority of the fight? I, I don't really see that. One thing I see that's super interesting is that um, Chase Hooper is actually 10% more accurate with his striking than Steven Peterson. That's not good. That's really, really, really concerning to me. I, I, am, I was really, really shocked to see that. Right, but uh, the striking defense for Chase Hooper is 38%, and the striking defense... So that's uh, 18 percentage points worse than Steven Peterson's defense. So overall, Chase Hooper's got like a negative 8% differential For sure. Listen, in his striking. We, but, we, but we know that he can't strike, and we've seen him get better-ish <laughs> as he's gone. Yeah, up. well, I mean, he throws some volume, 4.4 uh, strikes landed per minute. So it's not like he's not going out there and trying. I mean, he even landed 53 strikes on Caceres, who doubled him up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Caceres is, but Caceres is legit. They both have losses to Caceres. Well, definitely. I mean, that was a huge step up at that point for Hooper, and I don't think it was really appropriate. But uh, he was losing yeah. that Barrett fight, right? He had lost the first two rounds, or was it 1 1? 
I didn't really get to nah, that I, th- I thought, see, I had thought that he was on his way to losing I a think decision, it's... probably 29-28, and then he gets the heel hook late in round three. So that's interesting. Uh, I mean, he was winning the striking battle technically, just having 57 just landed taunt. strikes, but he landed 7% less accurate than Barrett and went 0 of 6 on his takedown. So it was like Barrett was having a much more successful game plan. He just got really sloppy near the end. So I really think that that would be like the same type of way that Peterson loses here is if he gets sloppy because, I mean, he does have nine losses on his record, so it's not like he's beneath losing. He's definitely not afraid <laughs> to lose a fight. I don't yeah. know. It's And, and I do agree with you, what you said, and, and you're probably going to be right, but Chase Hooper, by submission – plus 350 what i don't even uh, or by decision plus 380 i mean if you if you like hooper here i mean his i mean props, you have to play submission his props if are you booming. like hooper. how about double chance i don't know well, how does he decision, win a decision one, here what how does he win a decision I, I don't know i guess you're right it has to be a finish right because he's a great grappler he's not a good wrestler yeah, he's he, got a rubber chin, so I don't know that he gets knocked out. I mean, spinning back fist KO for Steven Peterson against Bravo, but I don't. I mean, Hooper, he's got like that that young. It's been a you fresh... know what? That's interesting, dude. I don't have I didn't check Peterson's uh his Instagram or anything. He hasn't been in the octagon since September 2019. He sat out yeah. all of COVID. Where where is this guy? That that is a good point. It's so been that, nearly two years. He could be very slow. Listen, so that's so that's where I say, listen, I'm leaning one way, and then you give me a detail like that, and I'm like, you know what? I should just stay away. There's a lot of fights on this card, and there's a lot of places where you can make some money, and I don't know that this is necessarily one of them. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, but if you ask me who I'm picking, I'm going to go with Peterson. And it's pretty much even money. It's like minus 118 and minus 104. Uh, Peterson, I, the slight favorite. I feel so bad not picking Hooper. I, I really like the guy. Um, I actually did like Steven Peterson coming up with his Superman uh, tattoo. I don't remember what fight of his mm-hmm. I liked. Maybe it was the Bravo fight. Um, I don't know. Losses to Brandon Davis. Benito Lopez. I mean, even at his best, he wasn't even. He beat Ray Rodriguez twice, who we know. He beat Erwin Rivera, who we know. We anybody else there? Nah. Yeah. Okay. I guess I slightly lean Peterson, but I don't know. I do really like Hooper. He he's the kind of kid, and the kind of fighter that at, at that age, at twenty one years old. You can see leaps and bounds of change, fight to fight, like you know, an indescribable amount of change. If if he's in the right camp or if he's learning properly, so yeah, the, and you know, I think he is training with a good group of guys with the Thompsons, so I wouldn't put it past seeing a good development in a striking game. And obviously, he's willing to mix it up. It's just about his ability to. So uh, yeah, let's stay away and learn a little bit more about each guy in this fight. That's that's how I feel. Yeah, definitely a good learning experience for early in this card um, where there's, like you said, a ton of fights. And it just gets it just gets better and better, man. I'm, f- I'm frothing at the mouth to keep going here. Yeah, dude. All right. So I think I actually might have a play on this next fight, which is kind of crazy. Um, we got Matt Frivola versus Terrence McKinney making a late, late notice step up here. And coming off of a fight, I mean, how long ago? What was it like? 10 days, 13 days ago? Yeah, I think it's... LFA? um, Yeah, it was LFA versus um, Michael Ortiz, June 4th. What's today? The the 12th? The 10th. So, six days ago. Yeah, and damn it. I mean, so... This isn't the first time we saw McKinney either. He he did have a fight a little while ago against... um, Sean Woodson on contender series. And that was a highlight real finish uh, for Sean Woodson. Um, Flying knee. It was brutal. And it was a second round flying knee. uh, And so the first round completely controlled by McKinney 
lands the takedown, you know, some strikes from bottom from Woodson and all that. But um, I think we really saw his wrestling skills. And Frivola, talk about wrestling skills. Um, yeah, I, I mean, he held his own against Sarukian. The steamroller. Yeah, I mean, we thought, you know, the steamroller might get might get finished against Sarukian, but he actually, he stood in there and held his own on like a one-day notice opponent change, right, essentially. Right, yeah, that was a really weird fight, and... And they didn't give him any credit in the in the betting market from my memory. And we did feel you and I, I think I even put Sarukin in a parlay. We did feel that Sarukin was gonna win, but that we felt that the odd the, they were a little wide. Yeah. And, um I guess it's when, when you when you win as you're expected to, it doesn't really matter how line how wide the line is, you won and you did what you were supposed to. But um yeah, you're right. He he did have a good accounting for of himself there. Definitely. I think he's good in scrambles, everything like that. I just, damn. I mean, so for Vola, I was kind of interested in playing him originally against Camacho. Now you're telling me that for Vola, I mean, minus 260. And if you go over to, to DraftKings, I think you actually even get a, a wider line, minus 305. So that means McKinney's plus 235 on DraftKings. Oh, wow. I think there's a lot of value there. Minus 260 is a lot of value. You have to play that now. No, no, no. I think you misheard. I'd plus 235, Terrence McKinney. Wait, what? You like Terrence McKinney? There could be some juiciness in that value there. I think this fight could be explosive. I think it could end quickly. And I think the volatility that it could be either side here. Um you know, yeah, I think McKinney is definitely a high-level wrestler. I don't think Frivola is the best striker, although he's willing. And uh, I think that this could be really close and, and a lot more interesting. We saw last week two out of the three fighters that were stepping up on like a week's notice, uh, especially off of like a high performance on LFA, that they really showed out. And, uh, you know, one of the, we did have one of them lose. But uh, it showed that, you know, in this new day and age, you know, a short-notice opponent, depending on – exactly where they're fighting uh it could be interesting you know mckinney is actually going to have a size advantage and he's a switch stance whereas uh frivola i i think to more of your point though with two of the three last week which is i do i just think that that's rare i, I don't think it happens very often and well, um i i think maybe last week's a little bit of you know some good matchups too uh, you've seen you've seen frivola um he trains at a, he trains at a good gym. You've seen him fight Sarukian, Pena, Turner. To your point, I mean a flyer on McKinney. Uh, that knockout by Polo Reyes is like that's like the scariest thing on your resume. I don't. I mean, Paul, all Polo Reyes really does have is is that little knockout power. But I mean, you don't want to see that. So, but that was you know three years ago. He's racked up some wins since then. Two wins. The draw to Venata. Yeah. I I get the shot. I can't hate it. I, Listen, I don't, Terrence... I, don't, I don't know anything stylistically enough about McKinney to know if there's any sort of matchup or or any any sort of advantage in that respect. Yeah. Three, I think... three inches of reach advantage. For yeah, that, yeah, for McKinney and a height, an inch of height. That's interesting. That makes yeah, you kind so, of lean your way a little bit. And then my my other thing is that McKinney was a contender series guy, so it's not like we're talking about someone that the UFC didn't even have on their radar, and they were just like, "Hey, we need you to lose like this week." Like McKinney had a fight scheduled. He was seven and one, and he was minus two seventy five against Sean Woodson when he lost by flying knee. They've been trying to find a way to get him back in the UFC, and he didn't have to go back on Contender Series. He lost to Derek the Minner by notice. first round sub. Yeah, after that, after that Woodson fight, and we all know Derek Minner. Yeah, I mean that's as high level as it gets grappling, and uh, af- and it was a triangle choke. So it goes to show you that he is wrestling heavy. He gets the early takedown, and he gets choked out with a triangle at 57 seconds in the first round. Frivola is not throwing up a triangle on him, so I'm not worried about, uh, about that. I, and if he does, he'll be more prepared this time. I mean, to your point, I don't know. Frivola has a 
arm triangle choke win against Luke Flores on the Dana White Contender Series? Arm triangle, not triangle. Like triangle. The okay, that's, a, that's yeah. an interesting point. His last three fights, um, 16 seconds in round one, uh, stoppage from strikes back in March. Then in April, uh, round one head kick, 16 seconds into the fight. And then uh, <laughs> on June 4th, uh, this past weekend, uh, round one knockout by punches, uh, one minute and 12 seconds in. See, so I McKinney's done. Yeah. Three and two, ten and four, twelve and three. I don't know how good these I mean, guys are. Well, but that's much better than, you know, facing guys like generally in a build up you see like two and three. Oh and oh, you well, know. Three and two is basically that. So Well, yeah, but then ten and four and twelve and three. Right, I mean but... that's re- and they're both in LFA. So th- those are much more impressive as far as that goes, because both of those guys have more experience than him too. But yeah, I listen, I'm not recommending to go out and make a huge play like i put 20 on collier say i put 10 on mckinney but i just think like plus 235 is a little bit too wide in this spot yeah listen i understand it especially when there's we know how much volatility there is in fights we've seen people step in on short notice and come in and win and uh yeah how would you line sean woodson against frivola You know, mm. like that's that's kind of an interesting point because McKinney was minus two something against uh, against him there, and Frivola, what, what would you say? You know, so like Woodson did have an impressive win, but that whole first round he, he was getting controlled. Yeah, so I listen. I'm not recommending to go crazy here, but uh, and I might even like say like my prediction is Frivola to win. But when you're saying like percentage wise that if you get, you know, McKinney to win is like a 30% chance. Like, I think it's probably a little bit better than that. So it's worth throwing like a little baby bet on it. Yeah. Listen, and Frivola has never exactly been my favorite fighter in the entire universe. So sure. I don't Yeah, I, I Terrence McKinney, a finisher, um, comes in about as exciting as anybody. I, I certainly was excited to watch him fight in lfa when i knew that he was coming to fight so uh yeah let's uh let's move along definitely so in our next fight here uh we have penny kianzad versus alexis davis someone that actually helped us make a little bit of money not too long ago against sabina mazo that was a great pick by you sir yeah chronic combat shout him out uh we were all over that one (laughs) Uh, so, in this fight, I think it's a little bit different than the Sabina Mazo fade spot. Uh, Kianzad's got a little bit more experience. She's 13 and 5. She's definitely taken her lumps, two submission losses in her career, one of those coming in the UFC uh, to Macy Chasson, of all people. She also lost to Julia Avila by unanimous decision. But her wins recently, um, you know, a little bit more impressive. Uh, Jessica Rose Clark, decision. Betch Cohea, decision. Sajara Eubanks, decision. So I don't necessarily see Kianzad being able to get a finish outside of some scar tissue breaking up on Alexis Davis <laughs> and maybe a cut stoppage. But um, yeah, I think she's a little bit more athletic and a better... She's a stronger base than Mazo and takes less risks in that regard. But if, if Davis is able to get her down... That's going to be for the rest of the round, and that's uh, where, and that's why I kind of want to pick against Kianzad here. Like, I I do like Penny, and I think if she keeps it standing, and and Davis like can't get it to the ground at all, she's in trouble. She's just gonna. I could just see her getting pieced up for fifteen minutes. But with the threat, with the possibility, with the chance that it could, that she could trip. That she could stumble. You could catch a kick. It's possible this fight goes to the ground. And if Kianza's on her back, I do not think that she's able to get up. I definitely agree with that. Uh, listen, the, the line's all over. Over two and a half is minus 360. So if <laughs> you think this fight goes the distance, just save your money. It's probably not worth it. They're all over it. Kianza by decision, minus 134. Alexis Davis by decision, though, plus 325. 
Isn't that interesting? Exactly. So I think when it, if it goes to the decision, I, shit, it's like 50-50 these days with the, with the judges. So why not? Why not maybe get like an Alir Latifi type win here with Alexis Davis where she spends two rounds sitting on top, maybe doesn't get as not enough strikes off to do much damage, but who knows? Minus 205. I think that's really irresponsible if if you like Kian Zed, just given that I don't think her grappling will will be able, be enough to like save her from the top control of Davis. But I also don't trust Davis to land the initial takedown outside of Kian Zed like messing up somehow. And she's a little bit more boxing oriented than a person like Mazo, whose like head kicks are like her number one asset yeah. and like really long legs and all that. So it like makes it easier to get takedowns. I hate to be rude, but in a, in a card full of bangers, this is probably, you know, your smoke break of the night. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just so predictable that it's going to end up going to decision at the end of it. It will, it will go decision. And um, after this though, it's really nothing but flames. So, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of way independent. I, I want to see how everybody looks faced off against each other. Alexis Davis is generally somebody that does look good at weigh-ins. Um, 36 years old. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's Listen, tough. two inches of reach. Last but she's time. given up an inch of height. Yeah, but, you know, lower to the ground, drives, yeah. taller, harder to stay upright, whatever. She's not a great wrestler like that in terms of, you know, offensive. Again, say I'm gonna save my money for for just I wouldn't say more bets, just I guess just bigger bets. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, hey, it's tough when we're five fights in and there's nothing I've we've loved yet, so that's tough. Let's get to one that we really liked. Oh yeah. The, oh our, boy, uh, so our talk dog about of the day. Yeah, talk about a really exciting fight. I think that this is like one of the best prospect matches that the UFC's put together in a little bit. I really cannot wait. Um, I'm not sure when we're gonna go to the to the stadium. I, I'm not sure what we've decided. Um, whether we're gonna be there from the exact start of the first fight or or whatever. But I know for sure my absolute limit. I must be in the stands by the time this fight is on. That's my personal limit. So we got Movsar Evlia versus Hakeem Dawadu. This is gonna be. A hell of a fight. I don't think we're going to see uh, Dawadu yelling about not being there and running away and getting yelled at by Kevin Zataki to, to stop cursing. You 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 can't you can't do that, Hakeem. Okay? Uh, keep it real. Or so, I forget what he said. It was like, dude, you got to chill out. Like, let the guys <laughs> yell at each other a little bit. Like, come on. Uh, so, man, 14-0 and 0 for Evliev, 12-1-1 for Dawadu. Evelyn has last beat, time out. Oh. I really, I don't think there's anybody I would feel comfortable fading Evliev. Like if Evliev, like does dominate here, I don't like. I don't know what happens. I don't know who. Yeah, gonna be. I guess, man. Because like, if you were gonna give him a tough striking matchup, I think that would do is one of the only guys right now that has the athleticism and the diverse striking at this type of level on the rankings to really keep up with Evlyev because Evlyev is a good striker. Not only that, but he's got the 85% takedown defense. I've heard some people tweet saying like, oh, that that 85% is going to be lower by the end of this weekend. And and it might be, but I I think this guy's a beast, man. I think he's athletic. I think he's got the the ability to, to keep it standing. I think he's got the technical ability. Yeah, listen, he didn't look great uh, losing by round one sub to uh, Danny Henry in his debut. But uh, Dawadu has definitely made huge strides since then. Just in his last fight against Zubaira Tuhugov, uh, you know, with Khabib in his corner, uh, one of seven on takedowns when Tuhugov in his career, uh, 46%. And, and that went down because of that fight. Wow, and that's so, really – 46%. I know that may not sound a lot. To, I mean, listen, if you're listening to our podcast, you probably know that 46% is a good number. But to reiterate – 46% while it, while it may not sound very good, that's very good for takedowns. Well, just for comparison's sake, I mean, okay, would you say Evlyev is a better 
wrestler than Zakugo? Just, yeah, just like probably. Okay, okay. So he's got a thirty-seven percent takedown accuracy. Right. So what people and there's a... <laughs> yeah, what people sometimes don't remember or uh, really think about is is when that's a major part of your game plan. You're shooting for more and more of them, so chances are you're not as accurate. But then you see somebody like Usman, who's just like incredible. What's his number? His number is like probably the highest of anybody's. Um, I will tell you in a second, just because my curiosity is uh, getting the best of me here. Um, 48%. Wow. So Steven still not like, you know, that's still, you know, you'd think, oh, it's not even that high, but that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, if you're taking someone down almost half the time that you try to, that's impressive. Exactly. Because you're talking about the high-level takedown defense starts at about 75% or so. I mean, like Khabib, Khabib, 48% takedown accuracy. That tells you all you need to know. So, okay, Evliev, a slight step down as far as uh, his efficiency on takedowns, but that doesn't mean that he isn't a high-level wrestler. And about his grappling, I mean – He'll leave his neck in the worst positions, but that dude is not concerned at all when someone wraps up a guillotine. It is crazy. I don't know how he gets out of these. Um, but okay, so let's Thank take God. a deeper dive. Let's take a deeper dive into the takedown numbers of of uh, Evliev. He faces Sung Woo Choi. He goes five of sixteen on takedowns for thirty one percent, and we're talking about Choi being a guy that you know gets taken down by a stiff breeze. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> wow. He actually stuffed 69% of the takedowns on a high high volume in that fight. Then you see Evliev against Enrico Barzola. Yeah, sorry to cut you off, but yeah, Choi, Choi ended up not only improving his takedown defense, but showed incredible takedown offense versus Yusuf Zalal in a fight that we got burned on. Yeah. And okay, so Evliev, 4 of 11 against Barzola. Yeah, that's a lot better. Then he faces Mike Grundy. He doesn't even attempt to take down. In fact, he gets taken down six out of 15 times for 40%. That's actually pretty good for Grundy there. And, and uh, you know, he wins on the feet. And not to not to mention that he, uh, Barzola actually outstruck Evliev. Yes, yes. So and that's super weird finally, to jump back finally, to that. Evliev, two of two against Nick Lentz. But on those takedowns, both of them were submission attempts from Nick Lentz uh, on the guillotine. Right. So. And then Nick he, Lentz went on to retire. Yes, yes. And Nick Lentz also uh, landed seven leg kicks on uh, Evliev for the time that they were standing. That's going to be important for a guy like Hakeem Dawadu. He's going to be throwing tons of leg kicks. He hurts almost all of his opponents with leg kicks. Evliev is heavy on the lead leg. He's a very good striker, very efficient. So, uh, you know, we've taken all this time to, you know, kind of – shit on his his wrestling and really all i do to say is that while it's high level he lands 2.75 uh per 15 37 percent and his takedown defense is 70 percent. so it's like he's a very good wrestler but i don't think he is as elite as um his 14 and 0 record is making it out to be and then when you take a look at his striking numbers those are actually much more impressive to me than his uh his grappling numbers but i think it's because stylistically Guys are, are, you know, looking for that takedown. And when you go 79 strikes to 20 strikes against Mike Grundy, a guy that just is lost out there, and 82 to 46 against Nick Lentz, but then against guys that can really strike, you know, it's a lot closer. So 4.7 strikes landed per, per minute against 2.83 absorbed. That means a 44% accuracy and 64% defense for Evliev. I mean, this guy, his striking is better than his wrestling. But when you're facing Dawadu, that's someone that's actually <laughs> – Bringing it from more angles, it's not as boxing oriented and much more kicks. And sure, that might skew the numbers for for accuracy a little bit, but yeah, I just think that Dawudu is going to bring something that Evliev hasn't seen in the UFC so far. And I think that Dawudu actually faced someone with a little bit crisper striking in Takugov and a better wrestler in Takugov. He's just way better than anybody that Evliev has fought. So when you take that into consideration and then you look at the line, the line is priced as if he's not making a step up in competition when he very, very clearly is. So um, the real question becomes, if you're betting on Evliev, if Evliev's your pick this week, what happens if Evliev can't get the takedown? What happens if the opening round starts out and he stuffs 
the three of them. You know what I mean? He's just going to keep shooting. He doesn't, there is no plan B. So that's a huge problem. Um, and I think Dawadu might be the guy to be able to exploit that. So uh, this is actually one of those moments where it's a little unfortunate that we recorded a little later in the week because uh, I fired away early on this. Um, a few days ago, uh, the line was plus 215 for Hakeem Dawadu. And uh, currently at the moment on DraftKings, because that's where I, I placed it, is plus 188. So I got a little bit of line value. I caught it before some of the movement. And at the face-offs, I mean, Dawadu is going to be a little bit taller and a little bit longer. Not by much, but enough where some people are going to see the kind of shape he's in because I saw it embedded. I mean, that guy's in great shape once again. Um, and that would do some more money might come in. So my recommendation as, you know, this will probably be released to you guys uh, by the time you're seeing weigh-ins and stuff. But if you can catch it before it moves too far from plus 188, I would definitely recommend it. That would do is someone that I think can make this he's, a great fight and he could win any, any which way he, if he can keep this standing. He's a huge, huge top prospect. I mean, and as so is Evliev, obviously. But, I mean, you even, even look at his win against Julio Arce before being to Hugoff, who is also, both of those guys are young, hot, you know, up-and-comers. Julio Arce um, has a fight coming up. He was supposed to fight Timur Valiev. And now he's fighting Andre Yule um, at the end of July. So, I, you know, these these are guys, they, they, those are real names. I mean, ha, I think uh, Tukugov or Arce versus Evliev are, are really good fights. So. Yeah, I, I saw, yeah, so I think that says it all. I mean. And yeah, I think, are, I think, that, they, I think yeah. that just a mismatch. I, I think that there's. Um, a discrepancy in the line here. I think that I think the Vegas is missing something. Uh, I agree, and it seems like everyone is kind of saying that Evliev is a slam dunk, and maybe we end up with egg on our face. But we're taking a shot at like a plus two fifteen, and now a plus one eighty eight underdog for someone that's this high level and that big of a prospect. Like his defense isn't Kevin Holland level, you know. Like this guy knows how to get up, and he knows how to stuff takedowns with proper technique and underhooks and. And getting the hand, you know, under the neck uh, when someone's trying to get the good head position on a single leg. Like, Dawadu knows what he's doing in that regard. He has good footwork. It's a big octagon. We're not in a small cage. So, uh, I, I really like the shot. Let's uh, let's get on to our next one here because that, that one, oh, man, that was so exciting. But now into another kind of big fight for the, the fly, uh, flyweight division here. Who could get a title shot off of this one? That's the question. Lauren Murphy versus Joanne Calderwood. I mean, JoJo, she's uh, she definitely came back out last time after an embarrassing first round submission loss to Jennifer Maya and put put it on Jessica I. But at yeah, that stage, what does that really say? Yeah, but what I mean, what is that? You know, only fans, Jessica I. I mean, like oh. this is the stage of Jessica I that we're talking about. This isn't bullet, you know, bulletproof vest, you know, before the Valentina lost but so now we see lauren murphy she comes off of you know the andrea lee split decision that was close uh roxanne Mataferi, she won handily in that one and then shakarova i mean absolutely outclassed her but that was a short notice opponent you expect her to do that i think what we've seen is a steady growth from murphy uh she's been working with the same nutritionist as uh, marvin vittori uh Matteo Capodaglio uh he's definitely done a lot as far as the nutrition and getting Murphy into great shape and I think it's really shown in the physicality in her last few fights and I think her grappling keeps coming around now a purple belt uh Jojo is still a blue belt and I think uh if this gets in the clinch if this gets on the ground and even if it stays a distance it's, it's tough not to think Murphy's not going to be the stronger girl yeah, that that's my thought. Yeah, you know, I want to I want to point to striking accuracy numbers and defense numbers, but it all goes to leg they kicks. All, yeah, I think we're agreed. It's this is a really really tough fight. Um, it's one that I don't necessarily have the biggest horse in the race on either side. Um. Ah, uh, God, you know, I, I yeah. 
Dog or pass, I like it. I, I kind of like it. I really do think Joanne Calderwood. I, I like that her husband's uh, Mike Wood, the owner of Syndicate. Um, so, you know, she's always working and she's always, you know, in the gym in that respect. She's got a gym lifestyle. But Lauren Murphy, man, it just might be her time. I think you said it to me earlier in the week. It's just like, it's just kind of like statement win time. Put this fifth win in a row. Secure yourself a title shot. You know, beat beat this contender, right? This is this has to be this is a title eliminator, no? Definitely. Definitely. But uh yeah, so I guess I mean I'm not going too crazy on it, but I did once again get a little bit of an early play in and uh Well what was the line you got? <laughs> okay, so I got uh Lauren Murphy at plus one twenty. It's still plus uh, one twenty. That line has not moved. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it seems like the sides are pretty much locked in as far as that goes. Uh, I do understand, um, you know, Calderwood has faced um, decent level, level competition. competition. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I, I just I don't know that she not, gets a finish, obviously, and I think that Murphy is more game in more areas of MMA. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think I definitely think she's gotten a lot better. I, I I think the the Chikagian fight is so weird. Murphy throws thirty five strikes. Chikagian throws forty five. That's so few. And then in in the Calderwood fight, Calderwood throws one twelve, or lands one twelve, and Chikagian eighty two. Yeah, a, it's like half leg kicks. Yeah, leg kicks. You know, so it's like, yeah, but they don't score. That like you can see she outlanded Chikagian, but she still lost. Right. You know, it's not like she's throwing ones that are crippling you. It's just like they're landing. Interesting. It's interesting. It's a weird style, and I, and I maybe you're right. Uh, the kind of peppering, peppering the steak kind of style is not going to really work against Murphy, who's going to be really hungry to come out and get this win. We're thinking. Yeah, she's been calling out Valentina for a while, so I'll uh I'll I'll ride with with Murphy here. Um, and uh, let's see how it goes. On to our next fight, uh, an, a rematch. Uh, uh, no contest in their last out timeout. Uh, and I don't know how much really changes from what we saw in the last timeout. We got Eric Anders, your boy, your boy. versus Darren Stewart. And, um, yeah, I mean, this fight's at 205 this time instead of 185. So we're going to see What's some What's the deal with that? Boys. Can you give me some details on that? I was You pointed that to me. Uh, earlier in the week and i didn't even realize that so what why is it yeah what is so i guess they just wanted to run them back as soon as possible and with stewart taking like a decent amount of damage in that that fight fight. yeah but like you know i I think they kind of cobbled it together on a little bit shorter notice to kind of fill out the card here and i think that you know maybe stewart hasn't been able to train as much because he probably had to take some time off after all that damage mm. so like they they probably had to agree to the 205 and like anders is going to be beefy man and and uh stewart i mean like he's going to be a little smaller you know uh, and uh it's tough to see it playing out much different i think stewart's still alive to hurt anders and anders doesn't necessarily like being hit but he showed the willingness to fight through it and get in the clinch and just wear on stewart so it's like Either way, I don't feel too comfortable making a play. And, like, this fight already happened, and we kind of saw what was going to happen. But it's like, there was, like, 20 seconds away from the round ending. So it's like, did Andrews gas out? Like, was Stewart just going to be donezo? Like, would he have quit on the stool? Mm. Like, uh, I don't necessarily think that. I think Stewart is a tough guy and everything. It's just, um, I'm, not, I'm not running to place a bet. And, like, honestly, if you ask me who I'm going to pick, I went with Stewart last time, and, like, now he's an underdog. It's like, it's not like he had a complete shit fight. And, he looked pretty you know, shit. I mean, he hurt Anders early, and then he gets put in the clinch and just gets, like, worn out. But, like, yeah, I mean, sure, i probably lean Anders. Like, Stewart, it's just not worth it. Yeah, and that's kind of how I felt. I'd Like you like you said so perfectly, um, was on Stewart last time, and uh, in retrospect, it didn't look as good, I, right? I mean, I felt kind of bailed out. <laughs> yeah so yeah i did feel taste. kind of bailed out at the time so uh not really rushing to jump back on a sinking ship 
Uh, very excited to just watch the fights. Uh, be there. In this case, this is going to be an exciting fight one way or the other. Um, maybe, how about the under? Under two and a half? Plus 120? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that this one could be a little bit more boring than the first one. Uh, it could be a super clinch fest. Super it could be, You're right. you know, just not great. So I'm really just not trying to bet on this fight. I'll be honest with you guys. This this is another one of those, like, it already happened. Like, the line completely flipped to where it should have been in the first place. And, you know, the, the value's probably sucked out. Yeah, nothing. neither of these guys are, um, to me, super dependable. Nah, and so, so why... Why even? You know, there's 14 fights on the card. We've already got a few nice. Well, I just feel like... bad because we passed like half of them. <laughs> it's <been> 14 <laughs> well, fights. We passed seven. I, the rest of this cards are going to be beefy in terms of bets and and sides. But um, yeah, just a tough start to the card. Very exciting though. So exciting. Yeah, no, I wouldn't even say we necessarily passed on that many. I mean, there's a pick on the Collier fight. True. There's a pick on. You know, a small play on McKinney. I like this, a, right? I like the Z. You know, the Dawadu, Murphy. You know, we, we got some plays here. It's just like, we. It, it used to be more of like, I need to bet every single fight. And now I'm realizing like, although I, I'm like, oh my God, I need to bet every fight. Like, sometimes I just want to enjoy the fight. And like, this is one of those ones where like, you know, there's nothing like screaming to me and I'm just going to be pissed off at myself for placing money on it and like come back to it and be like, ah, why am I, why am I betting on Anders versus Stewart? Why am I doing that? And yeah. you're like, why do I want to have that discussion after the fact? Just like, don't touch it. Like, and I hope that that's like a little bit of a lesson for anyone listening. Like, I don't know. Not every fight has to be the one that you have to touch. Agreed. But uh, Fully I think agreed. this next one, I think this next one though, you had some great points on. So, Drew Dober versus Brad Riddell. I mean, talk about an exciting fight, but this is also one where I think that there's a pretty good angle on. And you know what? I think you introduced it to me, so I'm going to let you take it. How are you feeling on this, Dober versus Riddell? Well, so the thing I saw about Riddell, um, other than the fact that he trains with Israel Adesanya, he's so quick, man. They don't call him... Brad Quick with Riddell for nothing. I mean, he's really quick. Solid striking. Um, working on, a, you know, super technical. Uh, working on, on on getting better in terms of his uh, ground game and, and, and uh, takedown defense. So, you know, we've, we've seen some improvements um, in that regard. But, you know, you watch him in his last fight versus um, Alex Da Silva. And uh, he dropped that first round without yeah. a doubt. I mean, he gets pushed up. He gets grappling. Heavy. He gets dropped. Um, he's got to kind of crawl his, and shimmy his way to the fence. Um, lost for sure. Lost round one on the scorecards. And um, you know, then De Silva kind of I don't know gases out and and is I, I don't know just doesn't really implement doesn't really throw any more strikes. And um, Riddell takes over for the next two. Um, when you look at Drew Dober, I mean, he went on a, a he had a three KO win streak before fighting the guy that absolutely nobody wanted to fight in Islam Makachev. I mean, nobody wants to fight that guy. Khabib says he's the next champion. Um, it's it's impossible to to get Makachev a, a decent matchup, which is why he's now fighting Tiago Moises. So I'm excited. Right. And, I'm, I'm excited for that fight, but I don't. I don't. I don't think Moises really has much of a chance, honestly. No, but to your point, who's the guy that Dober lost to before he lost to Makachev? His last loss, Benil Daryush. I mean, come on, what, talk about high level. Yeah, exactly. So you know he's had the high level losses. Um, he trains at the much better gym, in my opinion, at Team Elevation. Um, I think that. City kickboxing has, I don't know. I like Eugene and I like Izzy and all. I, I don't know. I think Eugene sniffs his own farts too much. Um, yeah. They were like the high, they were the hot shit. And then I think they just kind of, I don't know. They like the sound of themselves talking type of thing. They just kind of fell in love with themselves. And 
to me, there's all their fighters seem to have the same hole of like when they're put on their back, they, they can't seem to win. Mm. And um, I don't know if it's just a coincidence or not. But you look at Drew Doberman, he's trains with, with Gaethje. Um, he's just it's just he's had some not throughout his career but right now he's got some incredible power um he's he seems to be at the at the apex of of where he's going to be in terms of his career. no 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 this fight's in arizona it's not at the apex I, I, <laughs> I know, <I'm> just <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um, yeah so yeah. you know i think he's at his peak in terms of at you know at 32 years old i i i really like dober here I think the line is close enough that you can play at money line. I think the line is close enough that if there's somebody you love, shit, it maybe it's parlayable. Um, I do think Dober probably wins by decision plus one fifty five, but man, oh man, Drew Dober by knockout plus four sixty is so greasy. I mean, that is that's like double bacon. With extra cheese, kind of greasy. Oh, I mean, no kosher here at all. I mean, just super <laughs> grease. Yeah, man. Listen, so I I like that play a lot. Uh, Dober, I think, is a little bit more well rounded. Uh, he did have you know a little bit of wrestling background in high school. He also has his purple belt, and I mean, getting choked out by Makachev isn't necessarily. Something to be too upset about, but he does have four submission losses on his record, but he has nine submission wins. Yeah, uh, Riddell I has one really, submission loss. And if you look at Riddell, Riddell has no submission wins on his resume. So it's not and he has one submission loss. Exactly. So it is not it's not it's not an option for Riddell to have a submission here. And he's not gonna use any wrestling where you might be surprised and actually see Drew Dover secure a takedown here. So in that regard, I mean, you want to talk about crazy plus 1200 for a Drew Dover submission. It's not that far out of the room. No, it's not. I don't, I he think has more like submissions eight, than knockouts in I his career. I think it should be like plus 800 or 900 or something. Plus 1200 seems really high. Yeah. I mean, even if you put like $2 and you got like, you know, enough to go, out for like a really cheap two for 20 at Applebee's and, and leave a really shitty tip, you know? Yeah, like, so- shout out Applebee's. <laughs> if you need a um, I don't know. Yeah, listen, I guess that's fair. Dobers has a long career. He has seven submission wins on his career or nine submission wins on his career. So when was his last UFC win by submission? Um. He only had one of them. Only one against in his against debut. Jamie Varner. Yeah. And it's not his debut. That was his it, debut. It was his third fight. It was his win. His first win. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, yes. My bad. You are correct. Uh but listen, it's plus twelve hundred for a reason, so don't uh Yeah, I don't, don't go I throw don't on think some serious so. money in. Um and probably not. I like Dover. I liked Dover by probably decision, but I really like that knockout prop. And uh, as at least a flyer, you know, you, and, and let's be real. If you do like Dober, I mean, sorry. If you do like Riddell, the only bet is Riddell by decision plus 250. So I feel you on that. I mean, pretty simple. Sounds like we're both on Dober. So let's get on to another banger. Yeah, uh, Dober is probably my strongest feeling of any of the fights so far, other than Dawadu. Okay. I like but that. But now it's more like a faith thing, <laughs> like a faith in yeah. what we've read and what we see more than like really, I guess it's the same thing, right? Well, that's why, <laughs> it's a, we, that, that's why he's a dog, though. That's a different thing. Like when you have an underdog play versus yeah, like yeah, a favorite, you, you feel good thank about, you. you know what I mean? Like you still know in the back of your mind, there's a good chance they lose, but you're playing percentages and you're hoping that like you can, you can cash in on like possible. Yeah. You just, are, yeah, yeah. you just read my mind. You articulated that perfectly. Yeah, yeah. I got you. So now talk about craziness. Uh, we got the non-Jewish bear Jew. Is Paul he not Craig. Jewish? 
He is not Jewish. He just wanted a non-controversial nickname for whatever reason. That's a very controversial nick. What do you mean? Bear? How do you bear Jew? How are you going to be a bear well, Jew because, and not be no, Jewish? No, because it was from the fucking uh, Inglorious Bastards. And I guess there's a bunch of conflict in Scotland or whatever. So like, what? he just... He just chose like a funny I random to nickname. I that movie. It's been a while since I've seen no, it. No, no, I don't think it really has anything to do with the movie. I, I just really no, think I'm it annoyed. Was just I thought like, he was Jewish. Nah, dude. Like Paul Craig is just straight up. Paul Craig like, is like almost a Jewish dude. Yeah. Nah, he's just Scottish. I mean, like, oh yeah, did I say there was conflict in Ireland? Yeah, because I don't know what you're talking. Not, about. I definitely meant like Scotland. But anyways, there. I don't know. Anyway, so moral of the story is that. The non-Jew, bear Jew, Paul Craig. The non-bear, non-Jew. <laughs> the man bear pig. Uh, <laughs> uh, versus Jamal Hill. Cereal. <laughs> Paul Craig versus Jamal Hill. I mean. Sweet dreams. Th- sweet dreams are made of these. And uh, sweet who am I to disagree? Made of these. <laughs> Uh, this Who is gonna be to disagree. We're gonna see some blood no matter who wins. I mean, because if Paul Craig wins, you know he's taking a beating first. And if Jamal Hill <laughs> wins, you know he's laying out a beating on Paul Craig. So it's like no matter what, Paul Craig gets beat up. It's just whether he wins or loses. If Paul uh, Craig wins, it's all about Jamal Hill gassing out. And I at least from what I saw from Jamal Hill's last fight, um, with uh with OSP. He's willing to be patient, and he's willing to take a couple shots to uh, figure out his game plan and get in there. And what I've seen constantly from Paul Craig is like him rushing forward, and like within thirty seconds, getting rushed backwards and toppling <laughs> over on his back, and just like waiting for people to jump into his guard. <laughs> Yo, it's like a crazy game plan because it fucking works, right? Like. How crazy! How many triangle chokes does this guy have Too as many. a light heavyweight? Who the fuck else gets the triangle chokes as a light heavyweight? I think these guys really just don't know the defense because, like, who is two hundred five pounds but has the flexibility to, to to throw up a triangle? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess to make this fight maybe one of the more quicker ones to go through. I like Jamal Hill. He should probably win, but like we discussed off camera. Um, the line is so wide at minus 310. It's over 75% implied win probability, which means he's got to win eight out of 10 times for us to profit. What? It's just, it's too many. It just is. Yeah. So the line should be minus 225 minus 215 or something like that. It's, it's way too wide. And as much, and again, when Jamal Hill flatlines him in round one, his minus three hundred is gonna should be minus three thousand, right? Like what like we always say. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I, Paul Bearjew Craig by submission at plus five fifty. That's a it's egregious. That's nuts. That's literally yeah. nuts. So it's real simple. Paul Craig has four losses in the UFC. One of them was by submission to Jim Crute in the third round. Okay, that's not happening here. His other three losses, first round knockouts to Tyson Pedro, Khalil Roundtree, and Alonzo Medifield. Um, I feel like that might be a little bit of a trap because like you said, Hill is a little bit more patient. Uh, Hill's knockouts, um, you know, he does have one in the first round against Clinton Abreu, which technically didn't happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the weed. So he's um, got... He's got OSP he's got round two, two verse. He's got two in since coming to the UFC in the second round, though. Right. So, okay. I mean, you know, I could see where Hill first round plus two hundred, um, or round one or two minus one hundred five. But honestly, I mean, like you want to talk about pass to victory. Paul Craig by submission is plus 550. That's the only fucking way he wins. Like, I I mean, is that not worth, like, if you if you don't feel comfortable in Hill and you feel like that Paul Craig had some kind of way to do it, well, and listen, I'm telling I, you, I'm not playing this. The only other I'm thought, not playing the it. only other thought, which is just as crazy, if not crazier, is Paul Craig, Paul Craig by decision plus 750, which 
which maybe he wins round one and then till and then round two Hill comes back or whatever and then round three like he's just gassed and then Craig can sit on top of him or something like yeah that's you know that's what you're really hoping for but at the end of the day Craig is not comfortable striking is not a good offensive wrestler and doesn't even like I don't know, maintain pressure. Well, like he just wants to get yeah. like throw up triangles from his back. So Paul Craig is going to get beat up, but who's going to win? It's going to be Jamal Hill. He likes his Homer Simpson approach, which is literally just keep punching me until you're tired. And then maybe I'll have a chance to finish you then. So yeah, I so. like, I like Hill here. Um, I think him beating OSP was, was absolutely huge because OSP is, I don't know. He listen. He he he's somebody where you may worry about um, how much he cares fight to fight, but uh, he's he's legit in his skill set. So to 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 standing KO him is kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean nobody really knocks out OSP. Yeah, it was a standing TKO, but I mean that was OSP was exhausted. It was the first time he had ever missed weight in his career. Um, mm. But yeah, it, it was so... still impressive nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, listen, sounds like we're taking Hill. Yeah. But uh, if you want to go crazy, go ahead. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to do it. Don't so, point to it. Yeah, yeah. So next fight, uh, step up. We got uh, Damian Maya versus Bilal Muhammad. Uh, this is Muhammad's first fight back since being eye-gouged. Um, I'm curious if he's going to wear contacts uh, like he always does and. Is technically illegal, but I'm sure it didn't contribute positively to that. That's eyebrow. illegal. Yeah, what come on, the, bro. I'm what the police. Was the line in this fight when it opened up? I feel like it's gotten closer. And uh, that's because it, it most certainly has. <laughs> Bilal Muhammad uh, is now minus 230. Wasn't he like minus 350? Or am I on was, complete drugs? I mean, it was minus 245 when I took it earlier in the week, so I'm feeling a little bit stupid. Oh, yeah. um, he's uh, first leg in, in my parlay here, um, the big parlay of the day, Bilal Muhammad. Um, I think it's pretty simple as far as how this fight goes, um, as far as like what we can expect here. Um, you know, 2021, like we've been saying, hasn't been the kindest or, you know, even the end of 2020, in fact. Damian Maya, the man that had never been knocked out in his career, kicked off the pandemic era with a uh, knockout loss to Gilbert Burns. Right. So that the was first crazy. knockout in his career. That was crazy. Now, I don't think Bilal Muhammad, the king of the decision, comes out and knocks out anybody here. Let's not get crazy. And he's not submitting Damian Maya. So cross that off your list of crazy things to happen. So um, finally, you know, it's listen, it's Bilal Muhammad decision. Or Damian Maya by submission. Yeah, and maybe like, Maya gets a decision. Maybe he can. Damian he can Maya win the by decision is plus six hundred, and by yeah, submission it's just is like, plus four twenty. You know, he's not going to win the striking battle against Muhammad no. unless something is really wrong with Muhammad. He's just shown big strides as far as uh, his overall striking game. Leon Edwards is a huge step up, so I don't think it's fair to judge his performance there and. Damian Maya is not Bilal Muhammad in the striking. However, um, Bilal Muhammad can't be sleeping on the grappling. If you really feel Maya, you have to play him by sub here. The yeah. line's like plus 380 or something. I mean, but uh, yeah, so I, I felt confident enough that Bilal Muhammad is uh, defensively sound, a very good wrestler. Uh, the guys that he struggled with have been the big power strikers, um, the ones that put him on watch as far as defensively and uh, I don't think he faces that same type of threat here, although you don't want to underrate Damian Maya's work on the feet. Um, you know, it's impressive for who he is as a grappler, but um, Muhammad's faced much better opponents on the feet. So uh, it's it's Muhammad's decision or Maya's submission. I'm personally just taking Muhammad. I'm going to parlay out his money line. It's even a little bit better price for you guys right now, and if you wait a little longer, it might get even better. Uh, Bilal Muhammad, first leg of my parlay. I, I just... I think the guy gets it done. Um, he is going to be slightly shorter, same reach, 11 years younger. Um, I, I, it's time to say goodbye to some of our, our old veterans. Maya, you know, seems to admit that this could be his last fight. 
It's never the best of signs. Yeah, I mean, the problem with Bilal is that uh, every time he's taken the big step up, he's been unable to make that leap. Um, Jeff Neal, Vicente Luque. So this is, uh, it's at least a big step up in terms of a name. So he, listen, Maya, Maya could have one last trick up his sleeve, but Bilal should be able to come out here, be the quicker fighter, be the busier fighter, use his pace and his cardio to control this fight. And, uh, use his wrestling to be able to keep Maya from taking him down. I expect Maya to continue to spam takedowns. And yeah, I you know, Bilal could get that very elusive finish that he never seems to get. Damien's taken whatever it is, 13 months off since that crazy knockout by Burns. So yeah, I expect Damien to come out and give a, a show, probably his last show. So I, I do... I do like Bilal Muhammad by decision plus one ten. I think the fact that you can even get that plus money is crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's a pretty solid play. Like I said, I mean that's one of the two ways I see the fight playing out. It sounds like we're in agreement, and uh, you know I, I hope Maya at least makes a good impression of himself if this is his last fight. Yeah, and and if it is, uh, it's been an honor watching him. He's you know one of the one of the one of the best guys to you know never win a ufc title right i mean just Mm -hmm. uh i mean he just when you look at who he's fought man his losses are just to i mean anderson silva nate marquardt chris wyman jake shields rory mcdonald tyron woodley colby covington kamara usman i mean uh, yeah a 2005 adcc loss to jacare Souza. the guy's a beast He's been there with everybody. Triangle choke win over Chael Sonnen. So. Yeah. All right. Well, here we are. And this is uh, <laughs> pretty groundbreaking uh, for this next fight. This is the first time we've had a non co main event, non title fight be a five rounder, round. right? Yeah. First ever. Um, and who better than Leon Edwards versus Nathan Diaz? Yeah. They might need all five for this one. At the very well could, especially given uh, the propensity of Mr. Uh, once again, another decision master, Leon Edwards, uh, two knockouts, one submission, seven decision wins in his career. His only two losses have come by decision and to Kamaru Usman and Claudio Silva, a couple good names, especially back in 2015 and 2014 when he lost. I mean, this guy's on a huge streak, uh, technically ended with his no contest to Bilal Muhammad, but this, this would be his ninth you know, win in a row, uh, if, if he is to get it against Nate Diaz, I mean, 15 and 10 in the UFC and 20 and 12 overall record, this guy's been around, um, four knockouts, 15 submissions, four decisions. I do think Leon's wrestling and defensive capabilities make it highly unlikely that we see a submission for Nate. And like you said, we could see a fight that goes a long time here. Um, I think I'm excited. I expect Nate Diaz to come in, be, be rejuvenated. Um, I expect um, I expect him to look much better than he looked in that Jorge Masvidal fight. Um, that fight could have ended in that first round. I mean, holy smokes, did he put it on him. Um, it all started with a clinch. They were in the clinch. And as they broke from the clinch, Masvidal hit him with a, with a cracking elbow. And it just sent Nate flying and... And he started going crazy and kind of like ducked down to to level change. And that's when he hit him with that head kick. I mean, it was it went it went really bad really quickly for for Diaz, who then ended up saying that, you know, they kind of made him take the fight quickly, which I mean they did. It was literally three months after the Pettis fight, which the Pettis fight was like a war. And um, even still, that doesn't necessarily look that great in hindsight because we know that Pettis, um, I don't know, just isn't the same anymore. You know, he, he pulled out of PFL and is, you know, for the fight tonight and, uh, you know, it has, hasn't looked great. So, you know, Diaz coming off the bench here at 36, while I do expect him to be rejuvenated, like I said, and, um, 
you know, the fight being canceled a month ago is still interesting, right? Him having to pull out from that. I still think that that's an interesting narrative coming into this. Mm. Yeah, not much talked about. Good call. And Leon's a fucking beast, man. He's lots of feints, lots of pressure. We say this a lot and a lot of people because a lot of people do it, but he is absolutely incredible at switching stances. He might be one of the best. Um, he is um, extremely technical, extremely defensive. Um, the biggest thing that I think has maybe been his weakness that we've seen is his ability to be controlled in the clinch. Um, but I don't, I don't really see Diaz doing too much of that. He he really likes to box more. Mm. And if you try to box with Edwards, he's just gonna switch stances and piece you up and circle out, and it's yeah. ve- it's very possible that. It actually doesn't go the distance. It's very possible they don't need it. But the problem is, is that Leon doesn't put any pressure into his strikes, any power into his strikes, I should say. Doesn't put much power into his strikes because he's more focused on his cardio. And he never risks the biscuit. He's very um, calm. He's very cerebral. He will not risk a loss or putting himself in danger just to quote-unquote put on a show or make a statement Hmm. so that's interesting i mean i guess the one thing i say is not going to happen is nate diaz is not going to lose by submission here and the other thing that's not going to happen is that nate diaz is probably not going to win um (laughs) uh so my bet to add to my parlay uh very expensive right now sitting at minus 440 Leon Edwards by knockout or by points. Um, I mean, it's, it just seems so clear. We're talking about someone that's so so skilled. Uh, Nate, he can get cut up with an elbow. That that scar tissue is terrible. Leon throws that left elbow coming out of the clinch. Whenever someone starts boxing Leon, he clinches up with them. It's bound to happen. Are the doctors going to stop it? Is Nate fully recovered? His eye looks puffed up like a motherfucker. I'm not going to lie. I saw that right away on Embedded. Made me a little nervous as far as that goes. So I didn't want to play Leon decision. I did a double chance. It's pretty cut and dry to me. Nate Diaz is being used as a name. Seems like he's near the end of his UFC contract. And um, Is that true? How much do you have left in his contract? Uh, I'm not sure, but I heard him talking about possibly testing free agency. So, wow, I didn't I mean, that. That's crazy. It sounds like he's getting the bag here. Uh, He's always been a huge name for the UFC. Uh, Who knows where it goes from here. If he gets the win, he gets the title shot. Let's be realistic. Um, Which is kind of crazy. But, I mean, I think whoever wins this fight gets the title shot. I really don't think Colby gets it. That's a I think Dana White said that Colby's getting it, but that's a different Yeah, but Dana White says everything. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) <laughs> he also said fighters are getting a pension, right? And well, no, he said that he was fine. Not I read that here. Yeah, I, I, I know, but it's bullshit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you. Yeah. So, anyways, anyways, um, save that for another day. <laughs> uh, sounds like we're pretty well decided. Listen, the, I mean, it's it's gonna be fun. I but... agree, and and I don't want to tip our hand too far the other direction. I just I get scared when I see Brendan Schaub's you know, picks and it's an odds boost on, on DraftKings. Izzy, Figgy and Bilal all to win boosted plus 210. That scares me. Yeah. So here's what I'll say. Um, Those if odds you want to talk me. about odds boost and looking at, Oh, what do they want money on? Some of the odds boost hit and some of them don't. So do I think that one hits? I think there actually is a good chance that one hits. Cause then the other, uh, there's three more. Yeah. Exactly. There's three more so, just to cover them really quickly. There's yeah. three more Hooper and Frivola both to win. So it's no, very possible. That that one of those. I don't goals. think that. Yeah. I think both could lose. Exactly. Vittori Adesanya, not to go the distance. We'll talk about that one. And Jamal Hill versus Paul Craig and Faraz Ziem versus Luigi Vendermini, both to go under. And we kind of both we said that we might like see the... a decision in one of those. Right. So if so, not both, because yeah, because people think that the finish is coming in both of them. So that tells you all you need to know. 
you, so you should be, one of these is gonna hit. Yeah, I feel good about the parlay. <laughs> I feel good about the parlay one hitting. No, your part, yeah, the parlay one sounds interesting. I might even play that. Yeah, see, the reason I'm not going to, um, you'll hear the third leg of my parlay, and then I have a separate bet for uh, oh. the main event. So, um, yeah, I wasn't too sure. I was thinking of cashing out that bet, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that. So, anyways, uh, we were pretty well decided here. Let's get to our first rematch. Uh, the first of our two title fights. The first of the two reasons why you decided to fly out and go be part of this crazy historic UFC 263. Yeah, Davison just... Figueiredo versus Brandon Moreno. It's true. It's true. This, this is so exciting. Um, that first fight was an absolute barn burner. Took place for both guys three weeks after they had just fought. Davidson had just defended his title um, versus Alex Perez with an incredible round one guillotine choke. And uh, Moreno had the incredible victory versus uh, Brandon Royval, where Royval had the uh, shoulder injury at the end of the round. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, listen, both these guys came in, had an absolute war. Um, you know, the narrative is out that Figueredo had a stomach bug that he didn't have as much power in the first fight. I will say in the grappling exchanges, it did look like he didn't have his normal strength. So maybe I'm buying a little bit in too much to what the people are talking about, but for a big guy like Figueredo cutting weight twice in short period of time, you know, Moreno seems like one of those guys that has a little bit of an easier time making 125, even though he's slightly taller, he's not as like jacked and, and cut up. So I think Figueredo cuts a lot more to make the weight and um, having this fight a lot further away from the first one. I think that is definitely an advantage in Figueredo's favor. However, Moreno now knows what it feels like to get hit by Figueredo. And he's had six more months to prepare a game plan for his style, which is definitely difficult. However, if we look back at Figueredo's last, um, last time he had a rematch, uh, Benavidez, not quite uh, Brandon Moreno at this stage of his life. Uh, and he got embarrassed on both stages. So, you know, Figueredo, in his own right, is a very smart tactical opponent. Uh, sounded from the embeddeds like he was focusing a lot on his jiu-jitsu this camp. Um, he did get out grappled a little bit by Moreno. But uh, he did show the ability to use the butterfly hooks and get back up and, and really get back to work. It's just that he couldn't really dominate the grappling exchanges like he normally does. I think some of that will have to do with the strength. And, um, yeah, I, I don't see this playing out too differently from the first one as far as stylistically Mm. i just think that there's a higher probability for there to be a finish due to um just that like everything doesn't always play out the same way it did like the first time yeah i don't don't think it does i don't i don't think it goes the distance i mean i do i I think that it's possible that that figurato can get that finish um it's just the problem is, is you really can't play Figueredo until you see him weigh in. That's true. But did I already do it? Oopsies. You did? Uh, to close out my parlay, um, the third leg, I placed this um, pretty early in the week, like I said. So I might have not even gotten the best value here because I got minus 250. And um, yeah, I mean, right now it's minus 230. So... In this sense, I lost a little value on my parlay, but um, a plus 140, the three legs, uh, Leon Edwards, double chance. I just don't know how points, figure, I just don't know how. And Figueredo. I don't really know how Moreno gets it done. He's like, I really don't. He's not going to out wrestle him. Outstri- I mean, he's got, he has to clip him. He has to clip Figueredo. Yeah. Or it, hope that, you know, he, Figueredo doesn't have a gas tank. But he went five last time. He went so five like, last time when he was I, stick. I don't know. And let's be real, he was should have won if it wasn't for the groin strike. Right. And, damn, I mean, Figueredo, the, the way I see it here is that um, he just – he has um, just just a high-level ability to to finish. And I think he's going to have learned from the first fight that you don't get the finish by going for the head of Moreno. You get it by going to the body. And uh, we saw the biggest reactions of the whole fight from Moreno come when he was getting hit to the body. 
And um, I think that the kicks of Figurator are going to be much more potent this time. Mm -hmm. uh, teeps and everything. And then I also think that he's going to try to wear into that gas tank with a little bit more of a grappling approach and, and be searching for his own finish. I mean, Moreno has one loss by submission, but he's never been knocked out before. Is it possible that Figueredo is hunting more in that direction this time? He's got seven submissions on his record and three in the UFC. I wouldn't rule it out. And, um, you know, even though I have the straight money line play on Figueredo, um, you know, right now, decision, you know, that seems to be what everyone is know, agreeing on as the play. But right now, if you if you look at submission is plus 750 for Figueredo, are you kidding me? Yeah, that's seven fifty. Plus seven fifty. If you're gonna play a prop on this fight and from my from my end, I mean maybe I'm obsessed with submission props if you guys listen enough. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you know, definitely are. But I do but think But like uh I, that's not I mean, come what on. I listen, what I like, and I think if you're crazy enough to do it, um, I think you just laid out a pretty good reason why you can remove KO from the equation, whether it's cause he's not focused on it and cause and Brandon has never been finished before by KO. But if you do feel ballsy enough to do it, double chance. Figueredo by submission or, or decision. Plus 150. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's... um. That's another solid play right there, and you're getting plus money and taking out the least likely of the outcomes. So I, I definitely it's, agree with something just like that. You know, a KO, ground and pound, clipping, it, it's definitely possible. But, um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Moreno hasn't been finished before, and you saw him eat a ton of strikes. So Definitely. Well, hey, I think we did it. I think we, we agreed on Figueredo, and that brings us to – our main event of the evening and uh man um it was definitely a little bit of a humbling experience um the move up to light heavyweight adesanya losing to jan blahovic Huge. and getting out struck by jan blahovic from distance uh and when i say a humbling experience i don't mean for adesanya i meant for me um <laughs> i hope it was humbling for adesanya no nah, well no nah, of course and i think it was i think um he really took it the right way he accepted his loss and um from everything that I've seen, all the episodes of Embedded and just him in the gym in general, um, Adesanya has been definitely working on his grappling. Um, uh, I feel that Blahovich had like, you know, a little bit of like size that he could bring to the table and he almost matched the reach of Adesanya as well. But that brings us to this matchup. Israel Adesanya now 20 and 1. Versus Marvin Vittori, it's 17-3-1. A rematch again. I think this is the third one on this card. Yes, it is. Uh, Adesanya in this fight, however, is going to have a four-inch height advantage, which might be a little exaggerated. It could be closer to like two or three inches. But the reach advantage is not exaggerated. Um, 80 inches to 74. I mean, Adesanya in his prime at 31 Vittori 27, up and coming. Vittori comes in on an impressive win streak. Uh, he has two submissions and five decisions in the UFC. Uh, someone that, you know, probably isn't going to be looking to knock you out. And He's got pillow knock... hands. He has absolutely <laughs> no – can we just be honest? Can we... Okay, like, yes. If he yes. hits me, like, oh, let's be honest, I'm going to sleep. Come on. Yes. I'm curling up right away. I got glasses on my face. I got a giant nose. I don't want to take any punches. But in terms of a UFC fighter – and in terms of a middleweight, 185, this man has no power, none, zero. So while in the last fight, Jan, Polish power, his uh, two two hundred, you know, two hundred pounds power, right? Is just it's different. It's there's levels to this, and that threat of the power is not here, and the threat of the size is not the same. Um, the biggest thing that comes to my mind, the, the, the scariest thing of this fight for me, is that third round of their first fight. Anybody that's watched their fight um, should should be well aware of that third round. It's the one thing that Marvin Vittori is holding on to. It's the one thing that you know caused the judges to really make it a split decision. I mean, it was, uh, it was really... He grinded him out. I mean, it was it was like a uh, Jan Blahovich. Like 
I kind of wish I would have studied that fight a little bit harder because it would have been more obvious to pick Jan. Like it just would like, I mean, again, and we're such big Izzy fans that like, you know, we kind of get blinded and it just what it is. And, and we live and we learn from that. Like, you know, like I've learned from losing money on McGregor to Poirier. I mean, we, we've all had these fights. I lost money on Max Holloway versus Dustin Poirier. I mean, we've had, there's, there's been a lot of these fights where you're betting on your favorite guy. Um, I think that Izzy will have made the, the changes because otherwise it's, it's really as simple as it's blood in the water and he's as weak as he could possibly be right now or as vulnerable, I should say. And this is a legacy fight. This is so important because that Romero fight sucked and the Costa fight. Um, I think Costa personally is probably the most overrated fighter in the UFC. And then, you know, you lose to Jan in the, in the big step up. And I, there's no shame in that, but now you have to come out and you have to solidify your title with probably the biggest win since winning the title versus Whitaker. Yeah, I mean, okay, so things that Vittori might have improved since the first fight. Um, I think footwork, cardio. Um, he does check kicks, like, slightly better now. Not that I think he's great at it, but there's at least an effort. Um, but I don't think he's really improved his ability to, to not overreact to feints. Um, he also hasn't really improved his combinations and striking patterns. Uh, it's a lot of one-twos straight lefts um you know i thought hermanson performance was impressive in the fact that he went all five and was able to win four rounds but i mean the dude slowed down and hermanson slowed down too i I don't think izzy slows down in that regard i don't think izzy gets knocked down in the first round you know it's yeah um so um izzy is going to win this fight a distance i just he was unable to after two rounds the first time. I just, what happens later on? Like, what happens if if Marvin starts holding him against the cage? We all know what's gonna happen if it stays a kickboxing fight. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And listen, the one thing that is apparent about Marvin Vittori, the dude has got a blockhead. Yeah. So I don't think it's easy to knock him out. Uh, It was interesting that Adesanya lands that one elbow and Vittori's pointing to his eye like he gets poked. And that legitimately hurt him. So that was interesting because that was the first chink in the armor I saw. So I wouldn't be shocked to see Vittori finished at some point. I just don't think it comes early at all. I think it would have to be because he's gassed out on top of getting hit. And that's going to come from a couple of rounds of trying to wrestle. Yeah. And, um, you know, as we saw in the Holland fight, um, I, I wasn't impressed with his work on the top. Like he did a great job holding Holland there, but he didn't land any strikes. And, and also, I mean, <laughs> Holland wasn't showing the most impressive getups, although he had like, you know, improved from the Brunson fight. It still wasn't good. And I don't think you could really put too much stock into the grappling cardio of a Tory holding down a guy that's a fish out of water in Holland and, so Adesanya is at least shown improved submission ability and, and like Jan was able to get him down twice or even a third time. Uh, but it wasn't that he was able to get there early and he, he was only able to get there because he was winning the striking battle against Adesanya. And he was only able to do that with, because of his size, his, his reach. But he was and, only able to do that because he was in the octagon right. with him. Right. No, but listen, Vittori, I just don't think he matches up physically and, and you know, being a middleweight. Do that because his parents <laughs> genetically. <laughs> Polish power, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's Adesanya and over two and a half. Yeah. I have it in for a big fat hundred bucks Jeez. at minus 109. Um. And honestly, I might have put that in too early because pretty sure there's a little bit more value on that now. So uh, the times where, you know, I, I normally don't get out ahead and, and bet myself early, you know. Sometimes it helps. Like Sometimes now it's now it's plus 100. So where is that? Plus 100 where? On points bet. 
points bet. Uh, now I did win a huge bet <laughs> um, on basketball, so I told myself I wasn't going to bet on the Adesanya fight just because of my fandom. So take that for what you will. That I won like a thousand bucks and said I'll throw like a hundred on my favorite fighter. You know, um, I think Adesanya wins. Would I be completely shocked if Atori gets the wrestling win and and all that? I mean, maybe maybe not completely shocked. Yeah, I wouldn't be completely. But uh, shocked. I'd if, be surprised. If, if it, right, I'd be surprised. But if Vittori comes out there and starches Adesanya or gets a submission, yeah, I'm completely shocked. Um, I kind of would be. If you're I'd taking Vittori, do a decision. I'd be kind of happy for Robert Whitaker, though, honestly, because I think Robert Whitaker absolutely crushes Marvin Vittori. I don't think Marvin Vittori has a, has a like. It's just styles make matchups. So like. The right. threat of the takedown is 0.0% against Robert Whitaker. You're not taking him down. You're not getting inside. Like, it's just not happening. Right. So, but it's like, if you beat Israel Adesanya, it's either Adesanya's damaged goods or Vittori is good enough to potentially beat Whitaker because he would have had to make some strides on the feet to even get inside Adesanya. Not necessarily. So, well, in the third round, his footwork and striking were much better to set but up Izzy the takedown. Izzy was like tired. I don't, I don't know where Izzy's training yeah. was at that point. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it was only a, Izzy's second UFC fight compared to like Marvin's. Sixth I don't know, or say something. third, third, fourth, fifth. Like, yeah, it's it, it was a lot less, you know, shocking to see Izzy be a little bit better at grappling going forward and and defending some takedowns. And it does look like he came in pretty strong. Um, he looked pretty jacked to, to this camp. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I saw in the first fight, Vittori definitely had a strength advantage. And now that Adesanya went up, you know, not all the way to 205, you know, he's only like one, you know, a, a little bit lower than that. But um, yeah, I, I think coming back down, he definitely seems to have kept some of that muscle. So I'm, I'm interested to see him in these clinch exchanges because that is where he does some good work. Um, shout out Dan Tom. We're talking about his his capabilities and 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 defensive work uh, he does it best against the fence so uh, that's where Vittori likes to work himself because he doesn't necessarily get these takedowns in the open and um yeah once again you know uh shout out Dan Tom for that detail no um, listen, so, that, yeah. listen that, that makes a lot that. of sense to me um Marvin while he's gotten a lot better um like you said, I do think that there's still some holes. Um, his striking, his combination striking, you know, it's just, you know, there there are there are some things to be left to be desired. Um, it is possible that he can grind him out into the later rounds, but um, I, I you, if you're Izzy, you have to be so ready and so prepared for that. It would be just the biggest just the biggest mistake and just the you would just get laughed at i think on some level if he's really not ready if he really gets you know sat on for 15 minutes or something like i think that would be i think that would be absolutely crushing to his reputation Mm. yeah uh so that, that does it uh definitely an extended version of triple c uh yeah, combat. Really got into the conversation. I felt a little rusty. You know, I felt a little rusty coming in here. I'm 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 glad that everybody listened. Um, you know, obviously missing last week was really tough. And um I I definitely apologize for that. I'm really happy to be back now. And uh, we're really off and rolling now though. We don't have, we don't really miss a beat for a while. So I know I'm gonna just focus on 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 keeping it keeping it up keeping it going and and being consistent so um i thank you for for being my partner through all this and i uh thank everybody for continuing to listen cuz uh you know we we do it cuz it's fun we don't do it for uh for the money that's right and hey listen you made it this far let's uh let's give you what those those plays that we had were um for me I dropped a few early in the week this time. They were my most confident. I didn't want to let, you know, second thinking get the best of me. So Collier, uh, straight up. Agreed. Lauren Lauren Murphy, straight up. Agreed. Uh, then Dawadu, uh, two and a half times what I bet <laughs> yeah. on Murphy and Collier. 
straight up. Uh, then, as far as favorites go, we have our big parlay. I got Bala Muhammad. I got Edwards double chance KO or decision. And I got Davis and Figueredo money line. That comes to plus 140. Got a fat hundo on that. And then we got Adesanya over two and a half rounds and the win. Fat hundo on that, minus 109. So let's hope I cash on some of those. If not, going to be a sad boy, but uh, thank you for the basketball winnings for keeping me afloat. Yeah, I can dig it. Um, I'm pretty much with you on all of those. I think I like the ZM Luigi fight to go the distance. Um, maybe Alexis Davis, probably not. We love Dawadu. Um, and of course, your favorite, your favorite favorite, Drew Dober. Drew Dober. So I was just kind of throwing something a little bit together because you had such a nice saucy parlay. How about Drew Dober money line and Leon Edwards double chance? KO or decision. So you get Leo by Edward, Leon Edwards by decision or KO and Drew Dober money line. You get that at plus 105. Little little double your money situation. And of course Izzy, I like that I like your Izzy over two and a half. So and you can get a plus one hundred now. I, I'm the sucker at minus one oh nine. Uh but yeah, hey, uh glad being back and uh guru, take it away. Oh. Thank you all so much for listening, if you've made it this far. Uh, we appreciate everything that you do to support our channel, which I hope is subscribing to our YouTube page, um, liking and commenting on our videos, sharing them around to your friends. Look for us wherever you listen to podcasts, which hopefully is either Spotify, Apple, or Google. We are on all three. Make sure you subscribe to those podcasts on those apps so you get our new episodes the moment they drop while you're listening liking and subscribing feel free to give us a five-star rating and some feedback follow at chronic combat on twitter and at chronic combat conversations on instagram you can follow my awesome co-host tb scouting mma on instagram twitter verdict and tapology and you can follow me the underscore mma guru on Instagram, Twitter, Verdict, and Tapology. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We will see you next week for UFC Vegas 29, Korean Zombie vs. Dan Ige, 13 bouts. And I'm excited for that one, but I don't even want to look too far ahead because 263 is right on the horizon. So thanks so much for tuning in.